This video is for section 8.4 about polar bonds and molecules. The learning goals are to understand how electronegativity values determine the charge distribution in a covalent bond, and to understand intermolecular forces. Let's take some notes on that first learning goal. Understand how electronegativity values determine the charge distribution in a covalent bond. Electronegativity is a word that we had earlier this year. It refers to the ability of an atom to attract an electron. The higher the electronegativity number, the greater the attraction of the nucleus to an electron. And it was page 181 that had the electronegativity chart for the elements. Let's see how electronegativity is connected to covalent bonds. There is a type of covalent bond called a nonpolar covalent bond. This is a covalent bond in which the shared electrons are attracted equally to both nuclei of the bonded atoms. And this would occur when the atoms have equal electronegativity. That is, that the atoms are identical. Here's an example. F2, this is diatomic fluorine, a fluorine molecule. Here is the dot diagram for F2. The shared pair of dots here in the middle is a single covalent bond. This is a nonpolar bond because those electrons are attracted equally to the fluorine on the left and to the fluorine on the right. Perhaps you think of it like this. Those electrons are right in the middle between both of the fluorines. They're not pulled tighter to the left fluorine or tighter to the right fluorine. When the electrons are shared equally, it's referred to as a nonpolar bond. Let's contrast that with a polar covalent bond. This is a covalent bond in which the shared electrons are attracted more to one nucleus than the other. The electrons are closer to that nucleus, causing this end of the bond to be negatively charged and the other end of the bond to be positively charged. Let's look at an example of that. HCl, hydrogen chloride, or you call this hydrochloric acid when it's dissolved in water. Notice in the dot diagram picture that the shared pair of electrons that constitutes the bond is drawn closer to the Cl than to the hydrogen. That is because chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen. The nucleus of the chlorine atom pulls the negative electrons in closer than the hydrogen nucleus is able to do. To show the polarity of that bond, there are some symbols that are used. If that bond was drawn with the dashed line, then the end of the bond by the more electronegative atom can be shown as being a little bit negative by drawing a delta and a negative sign. The delta is the Greek letter D. The end of that bond by the other atom can be shown to be a little bit positive by drawing a delta with a little positive sign. The delta notation shows a polar covalent bond and it indicates which end is slightly negative because the electrons have been pulled to that end and then which end is slightly positive. Now let's look at H2O, a water molecule. Here's the dot diagram picture. The dashed lines are the covalent bonds connecting the hydrogen to the oxygen. Now, when you look up on page 181, you'll see that oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. So the shared pair of dots that constitute this bond are pulled closer to the oxygen. That makes that end of the bond slightly negative. And you show that by making a delta and a negative. The hydrogen end of the bond is slightly positive. Delta positive. And similarly for this covalent bond. This end you write delta negative and on this one delta positive. The extent to which shared electrons are pulled closer to one nucleus than the other determines the type of bond. This can be calculated using the difference between electronegativity values of the two bonded atoms. Here's a chart, and this is also on page 248 of your book. Remember that a covalent bond connects two atoms, and that each of those atoms has an electronegativity number from the chart on page 181. 
when you subtract those two electronegativity values, that finds the difference. When the difference is very small, that's a nonpolar covalent bond. Here's an example, H2, diatomic hydrogen. This covalent bond is a nonpolar covalent bond. And the reason is that the electronegativity value for each hydrogen is 2.1. When you subtract 2.1, take away 2.1, that creates a difference of zero, which fits in this range of the table, and so we know it's a nonpolar covalent bond. The next range of the table goes from 0 0.4 to 0 0.9. That's a moderately polar covalent bond. One end of the bond is slightly negative, the other end is slightly positive. Here's an example molecule that has that. HCl, hydrogen chloride. The electronegativity number for hydrogen is 2.1. When you look up chlorine on page 181, the number is 3.0. Now let's find the difference between those numbers. 3.0 subtracts 2.1 is 0.9. That fits within this range of the chart. Therefore, this bond is moderately polar covalent. The next range is 1.0 to 1.9, and that would be a very polar covalent bond. The electrons are pulled even tighter to one of the atoms than to the other, making that end of the bond even more negative and the other end of the bond even more positive. An example is HF. When you look up the two values and subtract them, the difference is 1.9. If the difference in electronegativity between two atoms is greater than or equal to 2.0, that's when it's an ionic bond. For example, sodium chloride. The reason it's important to know the type of bond connecting atoms is because that influences the properties of the compound and it will influence the reactions that that compound will have. Here are some check for understanding questions. I'll pause the video for you to answer these questions and then we'll discuss them. Okay, our next learning goal. Understand intermolecular forces. Atoms are held together with ionic and covalent bonds. But what holds molecules together in any sample of matter? The forces that hold molecules together are called intermolecular forces. A scientist whose last name was Van der Waals discovered two types of intermolecular forces. And so these forces together are referred to as Van der Waals forces. These two forces are dipole-dipole forces and dispersion forces. Let's examine what dipole-dipole forces are. This refers to the attraction between oppositely charged regions of polar molecules. Polar molecules are also called dipoles, hence the name dipole-dipole. In the last learning goal, we examined the concept of polar molecules, a molecule where one side of the molecule is positive and the other side is negative. Does it make sense to you that if two molecules are very close together, that the positive side of one polar molecule would be attracted to the negative side of the other polar molecule? That attraction of positive to negative holds those molecules together. The other type of van der Waal force is called dispersion forces. As electrons move around in atoms, they may temporarily be located on one side of the molecule, which makes that side negatively charged and the other side positively charged. For that brief moment, the molecule acts like a polar molecule, which means that the negative side of one molecule is attracted to the positive side of another adjacent molecule. That force of attraction holds molecules together. Those two forces are called van der Waals forces. Another intermolecular force is called a hydrogen bond. These are the attractive forces between a hydrogen atom in one molecule and a very electronegative atom in another molecule. For example, let's consider two adjacent molecules. One of the molecules has a hydrogen atom in it. And in the other molecule, which is really close by, one of the atoms is highly electronegative. It's one of those nonmetals from the right side of the periodic chart. 
the hydrogen atom from the one molecule will have a force of attraction with that electronegative atom in the other molecule. That attraction is a hydrogen bond. The properties of molecular compounds are mainly caused by intermolecular attractions in the samples of matter. Here are some examples. Water molecules are attracted to each other by dipole-dipole forces, dispersion forces, and hydrogen bonds. Therefore, water doesn't evaporate easily. For water molecules to evaporate, they need to gain enough kinetic energy that they break their attractions to each other so that some of the molecules can float off into the air as vapor. But if water molecules are very strongly attracted to each other due to all three of the intermolecular attractions, then it's very hard for water to evaporate. And good thing too, because if water easily evaporated, there wouldn't be any liquid water left on Earth. Another example, gasoline is a mixture of nonpolar molecules. So its molecules are attracted to each other only by dispersion forces. Therefore, gasoline does evaporate easily. This concludes the video about the different kinds of covalent bonds, polar and nonpolar, about polar molecules versus nonpolar molecules, and about intermolecular forces which hold molecules close together. All of this is important because it's these things that cause the properties of molecular compounds.